Okay, great. Uh, so welcome back, everyone. Um, just to remind you, last time uh, we started looking at the notion of secure multi-party computation. We looked at the very important notion of oblivious transfer. So in oblivious transfer, we have a sender, we have a receiver. Uh, a sender might have two strings uh, to start with. Let's call them A0 and A1. The receiver has a bit and the receiver wants to learn one of the two bits, maybe either A0 or A1. Sender doesn't know which bit the receiver learned and the receiver has no idea what the other bit is. So we saw how to construct uh, one out of two, two oblivious transfer based on RSA or based on trapdoor permutations. We saw how to extend it to one out of N oblivious transfer. Uh, we saw how to build one out of N string oblivious transfer and things like that. And in the end, we saw how we can get sort of a very powerful secure two-party computation where the only limitation is one of the inputs must be small. So with this limitation, we were able to achieve secure two-party computation essentially for any function that you want to compute. But one of the limitations of what we did in the last class was everything was only secure against semi-honest adversaries, right? Semi-honest adversaries are sort of honest but curious adversaries. They will follow protocol instructions. If you ask them to add two numbers, that's exactly what they will do. They will not report wrong result or anything like that, but they sort of keep their eyes and ears open. If the protocol leaks something, then they might learn something about your private input. Okay. So we want to go further, of course. We want to get security against fully malicious adversaries. Uh, we want to get uh, <clears throat> secure two-party competition, even for general functions with large inputs and so on. So we will have a lecture from today and we will have one more lecture this week uh, to sort of uh, go through these generalizations, okay? So right now maybe, let me switch gears a little bit. So let me talk about something which is very interesting, uh, coin flipping over the phone. Over the phone or over the internet. So it might look like I am sort of deviating from the main topic, but um, you will see why, why this is relevant. So the problem is uh, very simple. <clears throat> uh, you know, if uh, we are in the same room together, we want to flip a coin, well, we just take a coin and flip it, right? But what if uh, we are not in the same room together, right? Let's say, let's consider a bad scenario. We have Alice and Bob who are getting divorced and they just hate each other so much that they cannot be together in the same room, right? And they are deciding, let's say, who gets to keep the house. And they agreed to flip a coin and based on the outcome, uh, you know, either Alice gets it or Bob gets it. So how do they do this without involving any trusted party? In cryptography, we don't like trusted parties, right? So this is a notion which was, which was introduced by Manuel Blum in 1981. Um, this was really when modern cryptography was, uh, was sort of being born. Uh, so this is also the paper which introduced the notion of commitment schemes. And Manuel Blum used to be a professor here in our department. He uh, retired uh, like a year or two ago. Um, <clears throat> so the notion is, uh, yeah, uh, you, uh, you want to flip a fair coin. So let's say we have two parties. Let's try to define it it a little more formally. So, so a coin flipping it is a protocol executed between two parties, Alice and 
Bob. Okay. And uh, in computer science, it's always helpful to think of the outcome as either zero or one rather than heads or tails. At the end, uh, at the end of the protocol, so they talk back and forth in some manner. At the end, the parties get a bit. Okay, so let's call this bit, uh, I don't know, let's call this bit R. Okay, <clears throat> and we want this bit to be unbiased. Even if one of the two parties is corrupted and is cheating, uh, we want R to be a uniform random bit. Okay, so this is what sort of the security would ask for. So security says, even if a or B is corrupt and might deviate from the protocol arbitrarily. Okay. So here we are talking about fully malicious adversaries. Probability that R equals zero must be less than or equal to half plus negligible in N where N is some security parameter and probability that R equals one must also be half less negligible. Okay. Um, I hope the definition is clear. So now let's try to see how one might be able to design a coin flipping protocol. So let's go through a couple of attempts maybe. So our first attempt is <clears throat> just uh, let's not even bother using cryptography for now. So Alice samples a random bit R A and Bob samples another random bit R B and R is defined as R A X R R B. Right, so why is this protocol bad? Well, who sends their bit first? Whoever is second can just change their bit to be whatever they want the answer to be. Yeah. That's yeah, so let's say Bob wants to cheat. Then Bob can choose RB depending upon what RA is. And Bob can completely dictate the outcome of this protocol. Right? What if uh, we instruct the parties to send the bit at the same time, simultaneously. So I shouldn't wait for your bit. I have to, so we both speak at the same time. So, well, this is, uh, you know, maybe something like that can bring you some sort of security, but it's, uh, it's always hard to ensure that parties are talking at the same time, right? Uh, maybe I am very fast and maybe, you know, you started speaking and, you know, within a microsecond, I started speaking. So. If you use a like a bit commitment scheme to like replicate speaking at the same time. Yeah, so that's what we are going to do. So let me cross off this attempt and now let's go to a good protocol. So this is really why the notion of commitment schemes was, was invented. Right. 
So Alice will send some commitment to RA. Actually, let me even let me try to confuse you even further. So Bob sends commitment to RB. And note that these commitment schemes are randomized, but I'm not explicitly denoting the randomness here. And then Alice opens RA, Bob opens RB, and then again, R is just the XOR of RA and RB. So how about this protocol? Is this good or bad? Any obvious flaws? And let me try to tell you in advance that this protocol fails completely. But why? A and B learn each other's bit. Well, that's fine, right? I mean, these are just random bits. What if A always chooses one? Well, so you are talking about the case when A is malicious. That's fine. If B is choosing a random number, outcome would still be random. The so only I thing which we need from a coin flipping protocol is that the output should not be biased. Uh, sir, so I can like after uh, A opens RA for me, I can open RB in a different way. Like I can, since it's so only one bit, right? I can always open it in a different way so that A thinks instead of I committed to RB, I committed to RB complement. No, that violates the binding property of the commitment scheme. So uh, B can just send back commitment to RA and then again, yeah, let RA to good. RA. So very good. Yeah. So B, B can just copy the commitment of A. So B can always make sure that the outcome is zero by making sure that RB is actually equal to RA. Right. So this is just a replay attack. And now your next thought might be, oh, this should be easy to fix. A should just check that this, uh, these two commitments are not the same. Well, that, that doesn't help uh, either because um, think about El Gamal commitment, right? I can change El Gamal commitment in such a way so that the committed value remains the same inside, right? So just to remind you, El Gamal commitment was something like this, g to the power a, g to the power b, and then m times g to the power a b. Right, so I can, uh, I can take this, I can put R1 here, I can put R2 here, and I can put R1 times R2 here. So in fact, all three uh, values, sorry, all three values are not different, but the message inside is the same. Right, so this is, this is like a homomorphism attack. Given your commitment or given your encryption, I can commit to either the same value or a related value. And that's not ruled out by um, the security of the commitment schemes or security of encryption. So this attempt also, this attempt also fails. Okay, let me just try to adjust the camera so you can see more. Uh, yeah, this is a little better. Okay, good. So what do we do? Well, it's not as, as complex as uh, I was trying to make it. So here's the protocol. The observation is that there is really no need for both parties to commit. Alice commits to her bit RA and Bob just sends his bit RB in clear. And then in the last round, 
Alice opens. R A. And let me just note here right away that just keep in mind that these commitment as well as encryption, it's always randomized. So it's really RA comma some other randomness R, which I am not bothering to write down. And then uh, both parties can compute the output, which is R A X or R B. And now let's try to prove the security. So we have two parts in the security proof. What if Alice is corrupt and what if Bob is corrupt? So let's start with the first and probably the simpler case when Alice is correct. Okay. So now R A is some arbitrary bit. Completely dishonest. Maybe it's always one, maybe it's always zero, may not be random. Maybe it comes from some weird probability distribution. But the point is Bob is honest. Okay. So RB is uniform, okay? This means that probability that RB is actually equal to RA is exactly half. Regardless of what RA is, if RB is uniform, probability that these two bits are equal is, is exactly half. Okay. This also means that pro, what is that the probability of R a XOR R B being zero is also exactly equal to half. Right? Because R A X or R B is zero exactly when um, R A and R B are equal. Okay. And next, we make the following observation. So, with uh, With probability one, by the binding property of commitment scheme, Alice must send R A in the last round. And hence R is defined to be R A X R R B. And then we directly have the following that R equals zero is exactly half. So here, in fact, um, there's no opportunity for Alice to bias the bit in, uh, in any way at all. Right, once uh, R is chosen sort of Alice's hands are tied after that point. Okay, any questions about this case? Now, what if Bob is corrupt? So this case is slightly more interesting because Bob decides his bit after Alice's bit is decided. 
But now we will try to rely on the hiding property of the commitment stream. We will try to argue that uh, R B cannot be correlated with R A because of the hiding property of the commitment scheme. So if Bob is corrupt, then R A is uniform because Alice is honest, of course. Now. Here is our lemma. Probability that R B is equal to R A must be less than or equal to half plus negligible in N. And note that N is the security parameter which we are using in the choice of the commitment scheme, like size of the group and so on. Okay, how do we prove this lemma? If it were false, then that would violate um, the hiding property. Yeah. So this just directly follows from hiding. Um, yeah. If you can guess a bit which is committed and which has not been opened um, in any non-trivial way, you have broken the hiding property of the commitment scheme, right? And then the remaining analysis is, is essentially the same. Here, uh, you will end up getting the fact that probability that R equals zero is not exactly half, but half plus negligible norm. Okay, good. So this is uh, this is our construction for two-party coin flipping. Now we can try to extend it to multi-party coin flipping. So what is multi-party coin flipping? So you can imagine maybe you are playing an online multiplayer game and uh, there are multiple players and you need to decide which player gets to go first, right? And for that, you want to flip like an N-sided coin if there are N players. And you want to make sure that even if some of the players are colluding with each other, they cannot influence the outcome of the coin uh, in any sort of uh, non-trivial way. So in multi-party coin flipping, uh, just to keep things simple, we are still generating a single bit. So maybe the leader election uh, was not the best uh, <clears throat> example, but if you can generate a single bit, you can also generate multiple bits, I'll go into that later. So here, uh, multi-party coin flipping, it's a protocol between PPT parties. Let's call them P1, P2 up to Pn. At the end, um, each party learns a bit R, okay, single bit. And what we want is that even if N minus one parties are corrupted, 
and they are colluding with each other they have a joint strategy even then even if there's a single party which is honest uh, the bit r is gar is guaranteed to be uniform so this is how we will try to define security if some strict subset let's call this subset uh, s parties is corrupt we still want the probability of r to be 0 to be very close to half writing this is the same as saying that probability of r being 0 should be less than half plus negligible probability of r being 1 should also be less than half plus negligible okay good so now uh let's try to build multi party coin flipping so this is this is more interesting than two party coin flipping so what about the following attempt maybe uh, let's say just a building on our protocol for two parties let's say p1 commits to some random number r1 and after that all other parties p2 sends r2 in clear p3 sends r3 in clear and finally pn sends rn in clear all the messages are being broadcast every message goes to every party and finally we define the outcome to be just the xor of all these uh, strings okay so how is this protocol if p1 and pn collude they can just set the output yeah yeah that's a good observation um let's say p1 goes in the end and uh, if sorry pn goes goes in the end and let's say pn knows what r1 is then pn has full information about the xor so far and uh, pn can completely dictate the outcome of coin flipping so this protocol is not good so in the second attempt every party sends a commitment to r i and then later every party opens r i in what order do they do all of these things do they go one through n and then one through n or one through n and then different yeah just one one through n Okay. Well, then that's problematic too because people can copy each other's bits again. Yeah, yeah. So this uh, we already discarded last time. This doesn't even work for two parties because, uh, yeah. Let's say P n is the dishonest party. Let's say P two to P n they are all dishonest. Then P n can just copy P one's bit, and then they will cancel out each other. and then the remaining parties can dictate the outcome of coin flipping yeah if n minus 1 collude copy the odd man's uh, bit out here so this doesn't work either it turns out that there's a small change to this protocol which uh, more or less works out 
the idea is open in reverse order and what do i mean by that so first p1 commits and then p2 commits okay and then i only have two sides but then p3 commits so here we have the this order and then p4 commits and so on and now what we will do is the last party who committed has to open first so open rn then the second last party has to open the their bit and then finally the first party opens so now what happens let's say i am the first party and let's say somebody copied my commitment right then that person has to open that commitment before i do and then by the hiding property well their commitment cannot be correlated with my commitment because that would break the the hiding property of the commitment scheme so let's try to do it in a little more detail so we could have done this in the two party case also right yeah that's a very good observation actually here uh i was going to come to this so here this can be seen as first b commits to rb and then immediately opens rb so this protocol can also be seen as as same but of course i open i commit and then i open that's kind of meaningless so i can just send you the value if i'm doing that and similarly here uh, like the last party rn has to commit and open at the same time so that commitment is sort of meaningless rn Uh, the last party can just send rn but everybody else has to commit and then open and uh, let me not try to give a full formal security proof here um i will just give you the proof idea so say only a single party pi is honest everybody else is completely dishonest colluding with each other and blah 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 right in that case ri is uniform okay now let's uh, have the following so fact 1 is R one up to R i minus one are completely independent. And this is just uh, because they have to be. committed even before ri is sampled okay so xoring with these bits is completely safe ri is not going to get cancelled out or anything like that now next fact 
R i plus one up to R n are in some sense computationally independent. I have not defined this term, but uh, what it means is essentially you look at any of these bits, the probability that it's equal to R i is half plus minus negligible. And in fact, any function of these bits, the XOR of all these bits, it's a probability that R i plus one XOR. So precisely this is what we need. Probability that this is equal to R i is half plus negligible. And this follows from the hiding of the commitment scheme. And then when you put these facts together, these two facts, uh, you should be able to prove that probability that Ri is equal to the XOR of all the remaining strings is half plus minus negligible which in turn ensures that the ultimate XOR is, uh, is uniform or close to uniform. Okay, any questions? So what about, uh, this was multi-party coin flipping for bits, right? So what about, what about multi-party coin flipping for strings? So here, it's not a big deal. You really have two options. So either there's no reason these RIs have to be bits, right? They can be long strings, and uh, in that case, the outcome that you get is long. Another option is just generically, if you have a good coin flipping protocol, which only works for a single bit, I don't even care how it works, just works, then I can just use this protocol multiple times, right? So how do we generate a long random string? We just flip a coin many times, we just concatenate all the outputs. So that's fine. Let me write a disclaimer here. So the definition of coin flipping, which I presented to you is not the strongest. So there are even stronger notions of coin flipping, which are sometimes necessary for uh, secure multi-party computation. And so think of this as just your starting point. Don't, you know, go ahead and implement it and market it uh, right away. Now, why are we talking about coin flipping? Why did we suddenly switch from MPC to coin flipping? Um, let's come to that. So at a very high level, we have a protocol which is secure only against semi-honest adversaries. And we want to convert it into, into a protocol which is secure against malicious adversaries, fully malicious adversaries, right? So what can a fully malicious adversary do? 
which a semi-honest adversary is not supposed to do. So there are two parts to it. First part, a fully malicious adversary might deviate from the protocol instructions, right? If you ask this adversary to add two numbers, the adversary instead multiplies two numbers or carries out some other arbitrary operations and, and lies about the result, right? So that's, that's part one. Second part is a fully malicious adversary might use biased randomness or bad randomness, which might make the protocol insecure, okay? So the second problem is solved by using coin flipping. We decide the randomness, which this malicious adversary would use uh, by using coin flipping. So that solves the second problem. The first problem, which is deviating from the protocol instructions, we will try to solve it by using zero knowledge proofs. So I have a small so let, question. Let's see this in more detail. Yeah, this is just, uh, this is just like a thousand feet overview of, uh, um, of the compilation. Yeah, was there a question? Yes. So, so like uh, you said that the second problem can be solved by using what we just discussed right now, but isn't in these cases this thing inherent that the parties should not know each other's randomness, like the randomness should be private? Yeah, that's a very good point. So this is uh, possible. Let me come back here to the protocol. Maybe I should have even mentioned it earlier. So here, uh, like the outcome is completely public. But what if the outcome must only be known to one of the parties? It's very simple. Let's say outcome must only be known to PI. Then everybody except PI will open their uh, random bit. PI never opens. So in that case, PI has everything all the parties are missing at least one bit. But then PI can be like malicious, right? And like open something, but do something else. Yeah, so that's, that falls within the domain of lying about um, your okay, okay, computation, okay, okay. which we will try to solve using zero knowledge proofs. Okay, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you, thank you. So by the way, this is called the GMW compiler. This is a compiler which was presented in 1987, shortly after zero knowledge proofs for NP were, were built. And GMW is uh, Goldreich, Mikali, and Vic Derson. And uh, they showed given a protocol pi for semi-honest adversaries one can compile it into another protocol Sigma. For malicious adversaries. So the functionality of Sigma would be the same as Pi. In the sense that, let's say, uh, Pi solves the Yao's millionaire problem. Pi is a secure multi-party computation for uh, the greater than or equal to function then Sigma will do the same. So there's no difference uh, in the output, but on the other hand, security of Sigma is upgraded compared to the security of Pi. So it might help to have a concrete example in mind. Okay, um, let me present the compiler first. And then we will look at the OT construction from last time and see how this compiler upgrades the security of the OT construction. So 
maybe let's just uh, think about two parties p1 having x1 and p2 having x2 and then of course um, we are given the protocol pi <clears throat> so how do the parties execute pi so in any protocol cryptographic protocol or non cryptographic protocol how do you compute the next message which you send out in any given protocol you might use your input you might use some randomness and you might use the messages received from the other party let's call this the protocol history or the protocol transcript right there's nothing else there's nothing else so um how do i compute my my next message i have my private input maybe i need to flip a few random coins maybe i need to look at the protocol transcript and given all these things the next message is deterministic so how do we construct uh, sigma now in the very beginning in the very beginning i have my input and i have the full random tape which i will use for the entire protocol pi so given x1 and r1 x2 and r2 pi becomes entirely deterministic so now in sigma the first message of p1 would be com of x1 and com of r1 so i commit to my entire input and randomness ahead of time even before pi starts the other party is supposed to do the same so i am describing the protocol sigma now and then the parties start executing the protocol pi now let's start with the first message let's say let's say p1 speaks first in pi and let's say the first message in pi comes out to be uh, m1 so p1 computes so what does m1 depend on well m1 only depends on x1 and r1 
So P1 computes uh, this message M1 and sends it to the other party P2. Now P1 and P2 will run a zero knowledge proof in which P1 proves that M1 is computed correctly. Now P1 proves in zero knowledge that M1 is computed correctly. As per pi and let's call this commitment C1 here, this commitment is C2 as per pi and C1. So now can somebody tell me why we can prove this in zero knowledge in particular, why is this an NP statement? Because verifying uh, the message from the protocol pi, uh, like its commitment is a polynomial time thing. Mm, what do you mean? I'm not sure that I followed. Okay, so basically like, uh, uh, we were told that we can uh, prove for NP anything that we can verify in polynomial time, right? Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. protocol pi is, uh, the instructions of pi is polynomial, right? And uh, verifying that the message, uh, like its commitment is C1 is also polynomial time. Using these two things, like we can say that this is a NP problem and then we can use a zero knowledge. But uh, P2 doesn't have X1 and R1, right? So how does P2 verify that? So M1 is computed using X1 and R1, which P2 doesn't have. But like, this was the entire point, right? Like we can verify it, like that's the problem. If you, mm -hmm. I can verify it, then I can construct a zero knowledge proof for it. Yeah, good. So that's the whole point of uh, zero knowledge. Well, this, this um, so how, how you presented it, this one way of thinking about it, but the cleanest way of, thinking about it is just write down the witness. So witness, what is the witness here? Witness is just, uh, well, there are two commitments here. So I probably should call them something else. So let's call it C1 prime and this is C2 prime. So witness here is the opening of C1 and C1 prime. Okay. Now, if I give you the opening of C1 and C1 prime, you can verify that the opening is correct. It's consistent with what C1 and C1 prime are, you know, C1 and C1 prime. And then given these openings, you learn X1 and R1. Protocol pi is of course polynomial time. Once you have X1 and R1, you can compute the message M1 on your own. And ju just verify that M1 was computed correctly. So this witness allows you to compute M1 and uh, verify that M1 is correct. So now if you use zero knowledge, you can prove the same thing without revealing. So zero knowledge proof doesn't leak the witness. Now let's move forward. Let's say, um, P2 now sends M2. So P2 sends M2 and 
proofs in zero knowledge that M2 is correct. And again, here the witness to this proof is opening of uh, opening of uh, C2 and C2 prime. If I give you C2 and C2 prime, well, you have M1, um, so you can compute M2 on your own. M1 is public. So this is really nice. This means that maybe I don't trust you, right? Maybe uh, I suspect that uh, you are lying and you're not following the protocol instructions, but that doesn't matter. You can prove in zero knowledge that you are following protocol instructions, right? So uh, when we discussed zero knowledge, like proving some um, that graph is three colorable and, and, and other problems, it might have sounded a little bit abstract, but now you can really see zero knowledge in action, right? It's so much simpler to design a cryptographic protocol, assuming that all the parties will behave honestly. And then just for free now, uh, you get security even for malicious parties. Okay, and this is of course ignoring uh, practical efficiency right now. You know, maybe converting every message of the protocol into an instance of graph three coloring, proving that the graph is three colorable, maybe that's not the most efficient uh, way to go about it. And indeed, you know, there are like probably hundreds of papers written on improving the efficiency of uh, GMW compiler and going from semi-honest to malicious in, in a better way. But in this class, we are just focusing on the simplest possible approach. Okay, so this is very close to the final GMW compiler, but there's still a problem. So this is really maybe attempt one. And why? What is the problem here? Are we done? Uh, have we already converted pi into sigma with malicious security or is there something else? Well, the issue is suppose P1 is dishonest. So suppose let's say P2 is dishonest. So P2 star choosing R2 in a malicious way. So maybe this is a little bit abstract. So let me uh, go to the example of oblivious transfer. So if, uh, if a P2, P2 was honest, or if, if P2 was at least uh, semi-honest, then uh, P2 chooses R2 honestly, just by flipping random coins. But if P2 star is malicious, uh, you can pick an arbitrary R2. And there's nothing in zero knowledge which precludes that, right? In zero knowledge, I cannot I cannot prove that R2 is uh, honestly chosen. It's not an NP statement, right? I send you some random string. Can I prove that uh, this string is indeed random? There's no witness for, for things like that. So zero knowledge will fail you here. You cannot prove uh, some randomness is good or bad. So for that, we need to come to coin flipping and we need to force a party to choose good randomness. And how, and, and first of all, yeah. First of all, let's make this issue a little, more, a little bit more concrete. Let's take the example of oblivious transfer and see how, if you ignore this issue, it translates into practical attacks. So in the last class, we had a sender, we had a receiver, right? And the sender chooses uh, 
some trapdoor function, um, some function and its trapdoor and sends the function across to the receiver. Now the receiver was supposed to choose y0 and y1 such that only the pre-image of yb is known. The other pre-image must not be known to the receiver. And then finally the sender is replies back. The reply is not very important. So the receiver only sends a single message in this whole protocol. And the randomness of the receiver, let's call this R2, can be seen as, uh, say, B equals one. Then I can write the randomness as Y0 concatenation with uh, X where Y1 is F of X, right? So what is the whole randomness of the receiver in the protocol? One of the strings, it's purely random, and then the pre-image of the other string. Now, if the receiver is dishonest, the randomness which consists of Y0, well, Y0 could be chosen in a way such that even the pre-image of Y0 is known. Right, so this is uh, not good. So we need to make sure that everybody chooses good randomness. So let's try to modify the protocol or let's try to modify the, the GMW compiler. So we have P1, we have P2. So as before, uh, C1 equals com of X1, C1 prime equals com of R1, and then P2 will send R1 prime. Okay, P2 does the same and P1 is supposed to send R2 prime. And then the protocol begins. Now P2 must use um, R1 XOR R1 prime as randomness for the protocol pi. Okay. So P2 cannot freely choose the randomness which uh, it uses in protocol pi. It's, it's really some, some kind of coin flipping protocol between P2 and P1, right? And what if P2 lies, right? What if P2 doesn't actually use this randomness but uses R1 instead? Well, so you have to prove it in zero knowledge. So in zero knowledge, P2 must prove that the message M2, which uh, it computed, was computed using, uh, oh, well, this is P1. So P1 was use R1 XOR R1 prime, yeah. So P1 sends the message M1 and then P1 proves using a zero knowledge proof that M1 was computed using the input X1 and the randomness R1 XOR R1 prime. And the witness to this remains the same. If I give you the opening of these two commitments, you can just go through the whole thing. You can compute the message M1 on your own with this randomness. You can make sure that M1 is computed correctly.
And then the same thing for P2. P2 must prove in zero knowledge that the randomness which uh, it used is indeed R2 XOR uh, R2 prime. And right now we are talking about two parties, but this, there's nothing in this compiler that, that is limited to two parties. You can take a multi-party computation protocol for semi-honest adversaries, compile it for malicious adversaries. And there you would end up using a multi-party coin flipping protocol rather than two parties. Okay, so this is our GMW compiler, very popular, very influential. Okay, any questions? So let's see. So I, I want to start with the GMW uh, uh, with the <clears throat> with the general secure two party computation protocol for uh, large inputs. And that is known as Yao's garbled circuits. So I will just give you a very high level idea because uh, we'll need some more time for, uh, for this. <clears throat> so in our previous protocol, which only worked for, uh, for uh, functions with, with small inputs, at least one of the inputs must be small. The idea was that you run like a one out of uh, N oblivious transfer and right away in a single oblivious transfer, you learn the whole output. If both the inputs are long, that's not a strategy that will work out. At least uh, we don't know how to make that strategy work because the output uh, might have a super polynomial number of possibilities. <coughs> if both the inputs are long, the output uh, could have many possibilities and we cannot list all these possibilities um, inside of an oblivious transfer. So instead of a single oblivious transfer, uh, we will use multiple oblivious transfers. So we will work with, this, with the circuit representation of the function f and uh, we will go one gate at a time. And the idea is that if you look at one gate, it has small input and it has a small output. And for that, you can just use oblivious transfer to to evaluate this gate, right? So we have to carefully put together um, sort of maybe several instances and make sure that we uh, sort of uh, go through gate by gate and we start with the inputs and slowly we will end up with the output. So that's sort of the high level idea, of course, uh, we will go through the whole construction uh, maybe in the next class. Okay, so I'll stop here for uh, today and uh, I'm still around for questions and office hours.